Hello, my name is Tyler Olson. I am one of your hosts for Reimagine 2020. Today, I have with me three gentlemen who are going to be talking a little bit about the legal aspects of blockchain and the larger cryptocurrency space. With us, we have Jeremy Guzman. Jeremy is a graduate student in sports management at Mount St. Mary's University. He's also the founder of Mass Adoption LLC. We have Emilio um, Cazares. He is an attorney at Shepard Mullen. Is that a law firm, Shepard Mullen Law Firm? Yep, that's right. Um, an international firm, yeah. Got it. And we have Anurag Koyada, who is the director at King's College London Blockchain and venture development mentor at R3. Jeremy is going to kick us off. He's going to say a little bit about the nature of smart contracts, and uh, he's going to execute a smart contract via open law. And this is going to lead um, quite naturally, or at least that's the hope, into Emilio, who is going to say a little bit about um, the legal aspects of this space at a higher level, a more um, conceptual level. Um, and um, sort of the target there might be something like things that people working in this space would need to navigate um, in order to um, at least get to a point where they feel legally informed to make certain kinds of decisions. Um, and then Closing it out is going to be Anurag, who is going to be shedding some light on some of the fintech applications that um, some of these legal applications might have um, or might find a really nice use case within. And that'll be that. The floor is yours, guys. Jeremy, take it away. Awesome. Awesome. So before we even get started, thank you guys for, for having me and, you know, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm just going to quickly share my screen real quick. Awesome. Awesome. So pretty much what I'm going to go over are um, Ricardian contracts and then briefly transition over into what smart contracts are. Awesome. So with that being said, um, Ricardian contracts versus smart contracts, right? We hear a lot about smart contracts. We think that they're contracts. Are they contracts? We'll get into it. So let's start off with two questions. What is a smart contract and what's wrong with traditional smart contracts? Um, to kind of answer the second question, there isn't anything wrong or anything necessarily wrong with traditional contracts. In fact, we could write a contract right now in, let's say, English, and I'm sure all of us will understand it objectively, right? We'll have a basic understanding of what the contract has, has to say and the parameters that, um, that make up the contract, right? But now, what if I were to tell you that this mutuality of human language, this understanding, this basic understanding of English, right? It may be our biggest flaw. So you're gonna look at me crazy and be like, Jeremy, what are you talking about? So how, how is that possible? So it's not because we don't understand the language. Um, if that was the case, we wouldn't necessarily use English. Maybe we'll use a secondary language, uh, an alternative like Spanish, right? If we understood Spanish um, cohesively, right? As, as a unit, as a, uh, more of a uh, understanding on both ends. Um, but rather the flaw is our ability to use interpretation. We interpret words and their definitions in completely different ways in our own um, understanding, whichever it may be. Right. So this leads to some form of ambiguity of, again, the contract, of how the verbiage of the contract is used. And then sometimes it allows people to maneuver around these these bylaws or these clauses to then find loopholes. Right. So that's a big issue in traditional contracts is, again, the um, interpretation of the of the verbiage. So then this goes to Ricardian contracts. And here I quote um, Ian Griggs, who was the the founder and the originator of Ricardian contracts. And he states that a Ricardian contract is a digital contract that defines the terms and conditions of an interaction between two or more peers. 
that is cryptographically signed and verified. Importantly, it is both human and machine readable and digitally signed. So in other words, Ricardian contracts are, um, are places where all information from the legal document in a format that can be executed by the software or the code or, or binary, the language of computers can now understand the, the contract itself. And my thing is lagging here. There we go. And I kind of include like a little bow tie model here to, to kind of explain that. So here on the left hand side, we see the written contract and his, and his legal prowess in, in all its glory. Right. And then we see it transition into the digestible message function into a hash, which is then converted into um, into a machine readable language, which is, let's say, code uh, for short. So then we go into smart contracts. Now we're getting a little bit more complex. So Nick Zabo, the, again, the guy that that coined this term, he, he defines it as a set of promises specified in digital form, including protocols within which the parties perform on the other promises. So simply put, smart contracts allow for an exchange of anything of value, whether it be money, property, shares, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that is fungible, if you will, um, can be triggered and executed on, on a smart contractual agreement um, in a more trustless and transparent manner. Now, what exactly do I mean by that? So smart contracts aren't necessarily uh, smart. Uh, that, that's just a moniker that is a, a mere misnomer and a misinterpretation of uh, a misrepresentation, if you will, um, because smart contracts aren't smart at all, nor are they legal in, in any way, shape or form. They're just pure programs that are programmed to trigger um, uh, an, an activity or a transaction amongst two or more parties. Right. So here I, I just included a little um, a little infographic that shows the process of how a smart contract is triggered. So the terms and rules of conditions of the agreement is established by both counterparties and is translated into code. Then the event specified within the conditions of the contract is automatically executed. Again, assuming that the, the first party, the party that, that uh, constructed the contract has performed his, his obligated duties upon the contract. Um, then once executed, the terms of the agreement is automatically transferred, uh, the value to the relevant uh, parties, excuse the, the, the typos there. And then the final stage is settlement. The transfer of value to the counterparty, to the recipient will be recorded on the blockchain. And that's something we'll kind of get into at the end of the, the presentation. So now what are some practices for smart contract deployment? Um, there's actually four basic ones. So one is simplicity is key. Uh, just keep your contract, your contract logic as straightforward as possible. Uh, no one wants to, it's kind of like reading. No one wants to read um, all this fancy language if they just want to get straight to the point and kind of understand what you're trying to get at, right? So the simpler the code, the less it does, which means the lesser the chance you find bugs, right? So that, that's, a, that's a plus one. Um, two, it's okay to reuse the code. Um, if there's any library or repository that has a function or a string that you may need, go ahead and use it. That, that's completely fine, right? There's a big difference between reusing and uh, duplication, right? It's kind of like school. You don't want to plagiarize, right? So um, the code, a code that's more widely used, whether that's in uh, the respective repository, if it's more widely used, it means it's been tested more frequently, which means that it's more of a safer alternative. Um, and a repository, uh, for an example, could be like uh, Open Zeppelin and they offer pretty good solidity uh, libraries. Uh, so check that out when you have the chance. Um, three is readable. You want, you want the smart contract to be uh, legible, right? So your code should be clear cut and concise. Um, if you're aiming for, for some sort of contract execution that is of high performance, say like a compound finance of some sort, um, the easier it is to read, it, the easier it is to be uh, audited. Right. And you and that's a big thing with that, especially within the DeFi space is the auditability of your of your code. OK, and then four is the quality test. Just make sure that you take your time within your programming, um, especially within if you're trying to venture into this into the space. Bad code means monetary loss. It's, it's not good. Right. Um, so after you fit, actually fix the bugs, go ahead, test it out, test it out hard.
And then once you're comfortable with everything, just go ahead and execute it and go have fun with it. So now it's a brief introduction on open law. So now, um, now that we know the difference between like recording contracts and smart contracts, right? Um, we're gonna go into open law, which is a blockchain based protocol for uh, the creation of an execution of like legal documents. So it kind of mixes Ricardian contracts and smart contracts together to allow us to um, create and execute our own legal agreements upon the blockchain. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do a little demonstration for you guys. So here I have a bill of sale. So to the left, you see the scribe sales of goods. So you're gonna see all these fields in which we, we plug in. So say um, myself and Emilio are in the middle of some sort of uh, sale, right? I'm selling him, um, I'm gonna send him one die for an exchange for a non-fungible token, or maybe in exchange for one USDC, one US dollar coin, right? We're exchanging stable coins of the same equivalent value. Right, so I'm gonna go right ahead. And as you can see, it's highlighted the seller name. I am being the seller, I'm gonna type in my name, Jeremy. Is the seller organized as a legal entity? I am not. So you're gonna go right ahead. And now Open Law does an excellent job of providing various templates. I just chose the bill of sale to show how the execution of a smart contract will, will perform um, when it when it goes to transferring funds from one wallet to another, right? So proceeding, the buyer name, his name is Emilio. He is not a legal entity. Describe item in sufficient detail for demonstration purposes, right? We do not have a photo of the item. The purchasing price will be one, right? The uh, described delivery of item, no. This, the email, I'll put my email to sign. Allow me to get, oh, trying to get the chat here. The buyer's email. Yes, we'll be executing a smart payment. I'll be sending die. The buyer's public key. And my public key. Okay. So I'll go right ahead and review all the terms. Everything is good to go. I'm gonna send the contract. And on the bottom, you'll see finalizing agreements. And then varying on the traffic of the network, it may or may not go through. So just give it a brief moment and we'll see after finalizing the agreements, it'll say signing, um, waiting for signatories. So let's, let's wait a minute. Uh, so it gave me an error message, wait 30 seconds. So the, the system is a bit backed up. So we'll wait a couple of seconds real quick. I'm gonna try it again. All right, as you can see, it says sending to signatories and the contract has been sent. So now my page will be refreshed. I being the seller sign agreement. The agreement has, has been successfully signed. Has been successfully signed. 
And now we're waiting for the recipient. So now we're waiting for Emilio to sign the contract. Wait for Emilia to, to sign the contract. All right, perfect. So now on Emilia's end, he just has to click execute um, die token transfer call on the Ethereum mainnet. Awesome. And as you can see here, the, the execution has has begun. Die token transfer call on the mainnet starts now and it ends none since it's a single transaction. It's begun May 10th, 7.48 p.m. The transaction has been submitted and we can actually see it here on Etherscan. Awesome. And there you go. The transaction is pending. It will go through within the next five minutes sent by me to be sent to Emilio. And there you go. That's how you create and send a transaction on open law. Thanks for watching guys. Pass it on to Emilio. All right, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. And I guess it's good, good evidence too. I mean, you have now a contract that's stored in the indelible format of the ledger. Uh, so anybody hoping to, you know, seek to prove the existence of the contract shouldn't have that difficult of a time doing so. Um, assuming that they're able to find the, you know, the the original uh, participants and 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 preserving that transaction hash, um, yeah, like never before, there's this interesting database of of um, smart contracts and agreements and all types of information that's that's stored in a very robust format. Um, so I'll be talking a bit about smart contracts. Um, more so with respect to their, uh, like how the law applies to them. So a, a, a bit about myself, uh, my name is Emilio. I am an engineer and an intellectual property attorney practicing um, at a law firm called Shepard and Mullen. Um, let me just make sure I have this presentation going here. And How's the screen share working, gentlemen? Is it? That looks good, yeah. All right, okay. Um, so first I'll uh, reiterate that the uh, the opinions that I express here are not my own um, in any way, or uh, I'm sorry, they are my own and only my own, uh, and they're not the opinions of the firm that I work for, Shepard Muller, um, and that you shouldn't consider anything as I say as, legal advice in, in any way. Um, so a bit about yeah the history of smart contracts. Um, as Jeremy was talking about Ian Gregg developing this concept of Ricardian contracts, this this idea that you know hu human readable contracts and computer code can work in a symbiotic way. You can express contractual terms in, in ways that computers can understand so that they can 
learn how to execute the performance obligations within um, the, the domain of a given contractual relationship. Nick Zabo kind of built upon um, the Ian Grigg idea and um, was more focused on these embedded contracts, these, these contracts that, that were embedded in computer code. And he rationalized that by embedding contracts in computer code, it would make it prohibitively expensive to breach the contract, which would incentivize people to, to perform on their obligations, which is, which is presumably an economic, um, an economically positive output of any, of any type of contract where the parties are incentivized to deliver on, on their the performance expectations. But the only problem with these early theories of smart contracts were that there, there wasn't really any type of settlement, settlement mechanism to, to actually transfer value associated with the contract. So oftentimes like a, a contract is going to have a value associated with it, with the contract that me and Jeremy just executed. Um, it was more symbolic, right? But typically you would have, right, there's going to be an exchange of goods. Um, there's going to be services for a payment. There's some type of transfer of value that's realized in some way by one or more of the parties. And a contract that a computer can understand is one thing. Um, you know, it, 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 it's all right if it understands the conditional logic of the smart contract, but if it can't actually execute the performance obligations, then um, it's kind of like a symbolically cool thing, but it's not necessarily um, a powerful thing that can, can influence how people engage in commerce because it doesn't work. And that all changed, of course, when Bitcoin came around. Bitcoin kind of gave smart contracts a potential um, settlement platform because Bitcoin involves the transaction of value in a dis disintermediated way. Obviously, the, with the launch of Ethereum, building you know an application layer on top of a a admittedly similar-ish um, um, blockchain to Bitcoin, uh, but the more flexibility afforded through the unique programming language enabled people to actually um, um, develop uh, modules of code that could actually settle transactions. And we've seen a bit of that in the example of like the ICO domain, right? You send, you send some type of, um, some quantity of Ethereum to an ERC-20 contract and, and, and you can receive a token in exchange. That is, that is a contractual relationship. You put, accept the contract by sending the Ethereum to, to the contract and the contract or the counterparty in charge of that contract will deliver in an autonomous way by, by delivering that contract. So now you have a, a settlement mechanism on top of the, the blockchain that's actually going to enable these contracts to work. Um, but whether or not they're embedded in code, whether or not these contracts are capable of of being understood by computers doesn't necessarily make them valid legally binding agreements. Um, it wasn't until two years after the, the launch of Ethereum where we see states actually start to, to recognize the ability of courts to, to, um, to I, I'm sorry, um, uh, recognizing the validity of smart contracts. So prohibiting courts from denying the validity of smart contracts based on the fact that, you know, they're, they're in computer code and they're not the, the contracts that we're used to. So this growing state adoption is now paving the way for a lot of experimentation um, in this space, trying to merge these two worlds, the classical world of contracts and this new automated and de deterministic version of contracts. So, before going into the depths of contracts, let's go, let's take a back up and, and go into like the history of the traditional contracts. So what is a contract? I mean, it's essentially a, a, a mutually agreed upon set of promises um, between two or more people. Uh, you can form contracts in a variety of ways. People are, are I guess, used to the, the written way, right? I can draft a contract. I could, we could draft out the terms and I could sign here to show that I sent to the contract and you could sign and then we would be, and then 
all of the rights prescribed in that agreement would be the rights determined in our contract to the extent that they're not invalid for some other reason. Now, it's important to understand that like the paper is just a memorialization of the contract. Um, the paper doesn't do anything. It just memorializes a set of obligations. But the contract itself, the agreement exists in the abstract. The agreement dictates what the parties owe each other and how they're supposed to perform. Uh, the piece of paper memorializes that agreement. But contracts don't necessarily need to be memorialized. You can have an oral agreement. Um, I can say, hey, you know, I'll pay you 20 bucks if you mow my lawn tomorrow and we can handshake and you say, sure, right? And then if you're not there tomorrow and my lawn's not mowed, then I could sue you for, for breach of contract. Now, there's other types of questions. It's a very like fact intensive inquiry as to whether or not a, a valid contract exists, but there's nothing prohibiting an agreement like that. Um, it's, the, it's the fact that parties agree to something that, that makes it a contract. Um, so they can be oral. They can also be implied in fact. So contracts don't even need to be necessarily defined. They can be inferred based on parties' conduct, for example. So like, let's say that every single day I come over to your house with eggs at a certain price and you buy them and you buy them and you become used to me, you become used to that offer. And then what if one day, you know, you're telling me that you need eggs for Sunday and I don't come around on Sunday and I come around every single Sunday and I, and I have been for the past two years, you know, maybe our conduct and our course of performing um, creates some type of legally recognizable agreement. Um, so in, in those examples, um, somebody could be entitled to remedies under contract law, even though no explicit agreement. So contracts can be flexible in formation. Um, the requirements for contract in, um, is mutual assent. So the parties have to willingly agree to be contractually bound. You cannot have anybody agree, um, be bound to an agreement that, that they don't understand, that they're not actually accepting, or, or, or maybe they're accepting on duress, right? If I say, you know, if I have a gun to your head and say, I won't kill you if you give me $100, that's not a contract, right? I'm not I'm mutually ascending to those terms. That's, um, that's a little bit in, involuntary. But this idea of offer and acceptance, right? So I can, there has to be some type of offer where, where the terms of the offer are recognized and clear, and then there has to be an acceptance. Now, sometimes you accept a contract by performing on the contract. That's a unilateral contract where the performance itself is acceptance. In the lawn mowing example, if I said something like, hey, if you mow, if you mow my, uh, my lawn tomorrow, um, I'll give you 20 bucks, you know, you could accept that contract by saying sure, but you could also accept that contract by just showing up tomorrow and mowing my lawn. If you mow the lawn, that performance of the contract simultaneously serves as the acceptance of the contract as well. That's kind of similar to the contract with bearers that we're seeing in the cryptocurrency space. These, these smart contracts that exist on chain that anybody can really interact with, anybody can send their ether to and the contract is gonna dispense what it's programmed to dispense. Anybody can accept those types of contracts. Um, and then a similar type of analogy, which is often used in the Nick Zava literature is the vending, mean, uh, the vending machine example where, you know, the vending machine is a, is a standalone bearer contract. That means that anybody that wants to engage with it can be bound by those terms. And in that case, a unilateral contract, you perform by putting the dollar bill in the machine, that serves as the acceptance to the offer that the vending machine is offering. And then you get your soda pop, right? That's kind of an example of, of um, an autonomous contract and, and a more, uh, analog world. Now the enforcement of contracts. So why are parties bound? Well, we rely on the state for enforcement of contracts. We come up to an agreement. If you don't perform on that agreement, I can seek redress by going to the state. And, the, and if the court uh, recognizes this contract uh, as a valid contract, with, um, then they can, they can issue some type of remedy. Uh, maybe the remedy of choice is damages. So in the damages context, that's where I just want the money, right? 
if if I if you and I agree to um, mow the lawn at twenty dollars and you don't come around and then I I need my lawn mowed and maybe I hired the next kid and he does it for twenty eight dollars you know I just lost eight dollars on that exchange because you breached the contract that would be a damage remedy a uh, specific performance which is a more equitable type of of remedy is when a court will actually tell somebody to do something right like in this case it'll it'll say hey go mow his lawn you 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 breached the contract you have to do it it's it's a little bit harder to do that because it, it gets tough courts telling people what to do especially if there's a market um available for me to get somebody else to mow my lawn but the point is here that the state steps in to enforce these agreements um sometimes parties will contractually agree that they're going to go through some type of arbitration mechanism, which is completely possible. They can say that, you know, we're not going to go to a court, we're going to go through an arbitrator, which is um, thought to be a more swift and, and um, inexpensive way of resolving disputes. The scope of contracts are defined through their semantics. The actual terms of the contract are expressed in prose, um, words that that define people's promises. But the thing with words is that they're, as, as Jeremy had mentioned, they can have all types of meanings depend on who's interpreting them. Um, standards are really hard to embed in a certain type of rule. It's just gonna take up too much space on the paper to, to define every single action that a party can take. So that's kind of the advantage of traditional contracts is you can use the vagueness of language to, to capture the scope, a whole, a whole scope of possibilities and you don't have to define every single one. So an example in this light is like, sometimes people will, will um, require that parties behave in a reasonable way or that parties will make their best efforts to, to tender delivery of goods um, pursuant to a contract. Now it's really tough to decide, you know, what is best efforts, right? Like uh, is best efforts waiting to the last minute? Um, maybe, right? It, 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 that could be reasonable depending on you know how much work that person had to do or or how or like or maybe it's unreasonable under certain circumstances especially if the person knew that there would be traffic on the way there and and they got there late and you know the person didn't get the tomatoes in time for for that's not for that night's meals right there's there's all types of types of considerations and and, and possibilities in, in 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 these types of terms and words like best efforts or reasonableness tend to invoke commercial standards and commercial reasonability. So while in the moment it's tough to know whether or not best efforts were used or whether or not a given party's conduct was reasonable, we can always default on commercial standards and courts are going to look to those to glean a meaning from what the contract is supposed to mean. So if you're, you know, in the business of creating jet engines maybe there's certain types of standards that apply when you have to make a delivery to nasa then uh, versus you know if you're in the business of selling tomatoes maybe there's less um less or i'm sorry a different commercial a, a context in which we're going to view um what we expect of the parties so the vagueness can be a good thing but as we were saying before, these traditional contracts, they have their limitations. They, they involve transfers of rights all the time, transfers of rights, transfers of services, um, values, oftentimes even portions of contracts can be assigned for the benefit of other people, but it's all occurring on paper. There's no settlement, settlement mechanism in these traditional contracts to actually facilitate the transfer of value um, between parties. So these contracts are static. Now that's where smart contracts come in. And where did the, and where do we get the utility of smart contracts? Well, um, first and foremost, I think observability is a big one where parties can see how their how the counterparties are performing onto a contract over the contract's life cycle. So you know, like in the context of of smart contracts, you can you can see what your card counterparties are doing, um, which may be a useful if you're trying to establish how well they're performing on the contract. And um, it's going to reduce opportunism of the other side. It's going to reduce the incentive 
for your counterparty to eschew their obligations, especially if they know that that um, their activity with respect to this the smart contract is is observable by the other side. And in defining these smart contracts and and building them out with counterparties, you want to keep in track of like what type of conduct are we going to require to be associated with the smart contract. Um, certainly, certainly you would want to consider. Um, um, conduct that's that's relevant to the performance of the contract itself, because that would be good evidence of of, of the parties um, in, in their course of dealing with one another. Um, another advantage of smart contract being verify verifiability. You know, you have a permanent record of this contract, um, and all subsequent modifications of the contract ought to be understood in the context of that original agreement, so you can see the life cycle of this agreement. Um, and of course. All of the authentication that occur on chain would require the private keys of the people who are authenticated to interact with the, that contract, which in some circumstances could be um, a group or a subgroup of oracles um, who are authenticated to provide data or other type of authentications. Um, it could be a multi-sig mechanism, right, where you're awaiting the confirmation from, from some third party, such as like, like a trusted escrow. Um, defining you know, who these actors are and what they're allowed to do in the context of the smart contract agreement is, is um, important. Security and privity. So this is more just like on the technological utility of smart contracts and that they're cryptographically secure, um, meaning that it's, it's in the blockchain space, it's really hard for people to ignore the outcome of a contract because as we know, smart contracts deployed on the Ethereum blockchain and, and I guess general blockchains are going to perform as they expect to because their performance doesn't depend on any one person. It depends on a network of people. So you take the trust out of the two parties and you put it into a network that's going to execute this subset of rules pertaining to this contract. And that's a powerful thing, right? You have this contract that is going to run the way that the parties intend it to run or hopefully, right? Um, and there, in this context, it's clear like like who the parties are. So 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 you know all the people that are associated with the contract and all the people who have to be involved. You a a, a design principle of contracts generally would be you know don't involve people that don't need to be involved in a particular agreement um, because you you risk opportunism you risk fit, um, unfair unfair dealing between two people that may, may have an incentive to to um, um, eschew the obligations of the contract so in the context of smart contracts you can define you know who needs to be um, who, who, whose input and whose whose actions do we care about um, enforceability this one is kind of like the benefit of, of smart contracts, but also in, in, in the double-edged sword type of analogy. Yeah, it's the, it's, it, it's, it, it's the worst thing about smart contracts as well, because it makes them, um, it, 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 it puts a lot of tension with the traditional court system. So we like smart contracts because they're automated, they're verifiable, they're unstoppable. Um, you have these contracts that are going to reduce a lot of uncertainty if parties actually understand their terms because they can expect that the smart contracts are just going to run in the back end, right, without them having to interact with it. Now, that is a powerful concept because, again, you reduce the monitoring cost of the, of the smart contracts because you trust the smart contract to behave on its own. But obviously, the problem becomes, all right, well, if parties don't, ex don't behave as expected, or if there's a if there's a breach of a contract, right? Um, how do we enforce this con? How do we enforce this con? Or how do we enforce some type of judgment? How do we stop this contract if the party is if the counterparty is doing something um, incorrect or in breach of the contract that is resulting in an unfair advantage? How do we get a judge to to stop this contract? Well, that's tough because you can get an order from a judge saying that. The contract ought to be destroyed or ruled invalid. Um, but what is a judge going to do except for sign a piece of paper saying that the contract is invalid? Now, it's important to note that the, an order from a judge isn't meaningless, right? If, if people are going to ignore that order, they're going to be in contempt of court and there are penalties 
for those types of things. But, you know, are you able to find the, the counterparty? That's question number one. Does a court have jurisdiction over the counterparty? That's question number two, right? A court, a court can't, can't get all people in the world to come into court. Um, they have to have um, um, jurisdiction over individuals. So there's this problem where you have these global contracts, um, but you have very local courts. Uh, so it's it's interesting to see how that will will develop in this space. Um, I imagine that people are going to start to, as they draft out these smart contracts and agree to them, start to sacrifice personal jurisdiction arguments in the contracting process and maybe like submit to the jurisdiction of a, a, a particular tribunals in advance to avoid the argument that that a court doesn't have have, have jurisdiction over activity that's inherently decentralized. Um, the modularity is probably my most exciting, or uh, the thing about smart contract that I'm the most excited about, the idea that you, like, you have this open source community that are building out all useful tidbits and functionality of smart contracts that can be combined in unique ways. Um, they can also be understood in unique ways, right? You can start to get a feel for which types of, of contracting style fits for a particular firm, a particular organization. Um, and you can start to get real sophisticated in the way you handle contract life cycles, the modifications of smart contracts, and you're seeing these services develop, such as Open Law, that are facilitating these types of features. Um, and yeah, so like smart contracts and have their challenges that they present to the law, but um, they certainly have their unique benefits, which I guess will probably be realized more in the financial industries at first, because that's just the the native preference of blockchain is to be involved in financial transactions. But as as complexity builds and as software applications develop, um, you know, hopefully you'll see these implementations of of smart contracts in, in ways that uh, we're more used to, like the lawn mowing example. Um, so are smart contracts legal? So that's a, a question that really depends on the unique circumstances of each individual agreement. But as, we did, as I discussed earlier, um, contracts known in common law, which is basically like old law, it was, it was law before um, um, America was even founded and it's law that America adopted um, from old English courts. And that's again, that, that offer acceptance, uh, the mutual intent to be bound. Common law is going to recognize all contracts that meet that limitation, uh, whether it's an oral contract um, or a written contract, common law is going to recognize it. Now there are specific types of, of proscripted um, contracts that have to be written, and that's something called the statute of frauds, which we're not really going to get into. There, there are certain types of agreements that you have to write down, um, but that will have to be understood on the contract by contract um, basis, and it's always good practice to write your contracts down. Um, but the medium of blockchain isn't something that the law isn't capable of understanding or um, agreeing with. You already, as early as 1893, this this interesting case called Bib B. Allen. Um, the Jefferson Cotton Code was a, a telegraphic code that parties would use to exchange for commodities. They would place orders for bales of cotton um, or even options on that con um, cotton using an industry accepted code. So on one end of, of the line, you would you know just hear like dots, 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 dots. And that was just, um, digital information, right? That was just uh, symbolic information. It wasn't some type of like long contract that people would ordinarily think is a contract. But in that circumstances within this industry, people intended to be bound based on this code. So the court didn't have any trouble finding that, you know, there, there can be an agreement of pure information transferred over telegraph. And that's kind of like what we're seeing in this, in this blockchain environment, right? You have these agreements that kind of exist in the abstract, these smart contracts that exist on the Ethereum blockchain sort of exist in the abstract. They're just kind of operating on the back end. Um, but the court doesn't have a problem with the medium of, of blockchain so long as, as the elements of, of, of a contract are, are otherwise met. And 
there's a lot of pra- a lot of existing commercial practice that would support um, the validity of any type of smart contract implementation. So electronic data interchange systems have been used since like the early 70s um, to coordinate commercial transactions. For, um, they allow businesses to swap swap purchase order information, bills of lighting inventory data, um, various confirmations such as like in the supply chain, when goods were received, um, in what condition they were in, things along those lines already exist. That information is already being collected. It's not being collected in the on-chain way. Well, of course there are solutions now trying to do exactly that, but the existing practice since the 70s already relied on the digital inputs to supplement and to act as legal instruments. And there's a, a body of case law that that recognizes um, the validity of this type of electronic contracting. Um, you have a federal circuit case here at Lamley versus the Mattel saying that, you know, a signature over email, for example, can satisfy the statute of fraud. So we're gonna accept, you know, the uh, ephemeral transmission of an email um, to act as a, a a signature because again the person who signs over that email intends to be bound and even more interesting which probably plays more into like the algorithmic abilities and and capabilities of smart contracts to i don't know control like a variable price rate right like if if if, if i if we wanted to cut, come to an agreement uh, on a transfer of cotton maybe we want to use the market value of cotton um, but the market value of cotton is changing, right? So we we need to define the parameters that are that are going to determine that contractual term, the price of the good. Um, and in and and parties for a long time have used algorithms to define those terms, right? Um, there's a lot of a lot of of case law out there, um, especially in the UCC line of cases that support that type of algorithmic contracting. Now. To the extent that it's reasonable, right? The uh, a court's not going to say, "Oh, like, well, this algorithm, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it hyperbolically reached infinity because somebody divided by zero, and therefore, right?" It's like, no, no, no. It's it, it's got to be a commercially uh, reasonable within any given context. But it's really interesting because it kind of powers smart contracts. Um, to experiment with those types of solutions, which people are undoubtedly already doing. Um, and then with the UCC, the eSign Act, and the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, there's already a, a, a swarm of federal precedent with the eSign Act and the um, Uniform Electronic Transaction Act supporting the notion of electronic signatures, supporting the notion of, of programs or code that are intended to act as agents for people or institutions to fulfill or perform contractual terms. Um, while those laws weren't were not drafted in a way that um, anticipated blockchain or even that really like neatly captures blockchain, they certainly are going to be persuasive to courts and act as authority, in my opinion, when these types of questions come up. Um, because we've been signing and doing electronic contracting for a long time now. There's no, there's no type of uh, proscription against it at all. Um, uh, with respect to the UCC, which is kind of what a lot of people in this space are interested in understanding a bit, because the Uniform Commercial Code is kind of the Bible of contracts for for a lot of international actors, um, and, and especially here um, domestically. Um, it it codifies a lot of portions of of common law contract code, but it defines them um, in the context of, of known commercial practices. Um, so here's kind of like an effort where people are are interested in, in understanding how to create smart contract implementations for all provisions of the UCC. So that's kind of like the trend that's happening now. And, and it makes sense because that would probably be um, the area that's most familiar two courts and perhaps most likely um, it, it, it throughout that that might earn s- smart contracts the most predict- predictable type of, of protection. So considerations for smart contract formation. Um, early on when you're developing these smart contracts, you need to be deciding, you know, what needs to be automated, right? Um, 
smart contracts, they're very powerful, but the way that I see them right now, they serve a, a somewhat narrow type of performance in that you don't want to overwork the contract. You want the contract to do what it does best, um, transmitting units of value, understanding a predictable type of conditional inputs. You don't necessarily you know, want a smart contract to be able to quantify what is reasonable activity. A smart contract might have a lot of difficulty in that. And if anybody on the other side is trying to create um, a reasonableness clause within a smart contract where the smart contract decides what is reasonable, that should raise some eyebrows, right? Because it's like who created these criteria and who are and and, and who um, is the criteria more favorable to? Um, and, and other type of simple questions. How is the contract accepted, right? Are we going to send funds to this contract? Does it require a signature of both parties to be activated? These are all types of things that parties would want to specify, um, whether as uh, um, comments in the code or more preferably using supplemental actual agreements on paper with written words that are designed to supplement and, and, and contextualize what the smart contract is supposed to be doing. Um, same with how contracts would be, would be terminated. When is the contract going to be terminated? When there's no money left inside of it, when contract, when, when the parties um, destroy it, there's all types of, of, of ways to, to terminate a contract. And you want to be sure that you define all the acceptable ways um, that a contract can be terminated so that when a contract is terminated, um, a court or you as a party are able to understand like, okay, this contract is terminated. It is legally void because a termination um, condition has been met. Uh, all of those types of, of parameters want, um, uh, you'll want to understand and define. Um, and then, you know, as, as any good programmer will tell you in this space, it's, it, it's, it's a good idea to have a smart contract audit to use code with high reputable value. Um, the last thing that you want in this environment is for a contract to behave in an unexpected way. Um, again, because that's this whole uh, meeting of the minds thing. This, like you have to understand the code and a smart contract will, will assist in that process. Because if, if, a, if, if code behaves in an unpredictable way, if there's a bug or if there's some type of issue, it's really easy for parties to say, oh, okay, well, you know, there's no contract because how can you say that there was a meeting of the minds that you intended to be bound by this contract um, if the contract is behaving in an unexpected way? You could always argue that I intended to be inbound by the smart contract that was supposed to work as the developer designed it, but now it's got a bug and now, you know, it wasn't my intent to in agree to a buggy contract. Now, this is where you need robust representations and warranties, especially if you're on the party who, if you're the party who is designing the contract and may bear some of the liability for any performance, performance defects. You want the other side to say, hey, I've read this smart contract. I understand this contract. I have had an opportunity to audit the smart contract. I, you know, I hereby a represent and warrant that, that what you make a, a representation that, that you understand the code and maybe you would um, put on paper that, that, you know, you don't have any right to, to challenge that the code didn't, didn't behave as expected. So that's something that the smart contract on its own couldn't understand um, that, but if you if you have a supplemental contract off chain that makes those representations and warranties and association with the smart contract, then you give yourself more legal protection. And smart contract are just software. This is like a, an important distinction because a lot of the times these smart contracts, you know, they're not they're not being implemented all the time to to um, a, 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 to memorialize a classical legal agreement like the lawnmower example, right? How many people are using smart contracts for that purpose? Probably not very many. Um, a lot of people are deploying smart contracts for more administrative type of functions, right? Like I can, I can create a payroll within my decentralized organization and the code that would execute that payroll that, you know, that would fall in the smart contract domain. It's code that runs pro programs on a blockchain. But 
I don't necessarily want to create any contractual commitments between me and the people that are on that payroll just by deploying that software. Um, maybe I am using this smart contract, quote unquote, as just software, and I don't want it to create the presumption of any type of contractual entitlements. That is a, a type of scenario that you want to consider when you're using smart contracts in this more just pure tr transactional and process oriented approach. You want to make sure that that the people who are receiving any any benefits from those smart contracts understand um, um, that there's not necessarily any type of entitlement to a contractual right. Um, protecting smart contracts. So now it's and it is extremely interesting, like this whole game theory type of mechanic now in the blockchain space, right? You have these organizations, like I guess let's use the DAO, for example, that was you know, an, or, an organization that it, um, existed on the Ethereum blockchain. There was all types of rules and all types of modules of smart contracts that interacted with each other to, to fulfill this, this awesome type of organization, right? That could efficiently allocate capital, um, but it was hacked. And it wasn't hacked in any way that was prohibited by the blockchain um, inherently, right? It, it was hacked, in my opinion, kind of in a fair, in, in a fair way because a person realized defects in the code um, and they exploited those defects. But when you have members of an organization or counterparties to an agreement, you definitely want to prohibit that type of gamification um, because code, if you treat the code as pure law um, and you're saying that anything that the code does is going to be the outcome that we will recognize, then maybe that opens up the doors for parties to start to exploit these, these contracts or try to do some type of like distributed denial of service attack on these contracts. That type of behavior ought to be understood as not being okay um, to the extent that parties aren't trying to exploit those um, contracts for the pure purposes of understanding um, security vulnerabilities. Um, but it's kind of interesting because in the DAO circumstance, you know, the outcome of that was obviously the Ethereum fork, um, which, which was controversial at the time because people thought, hey, like they, because when they engaged in the DAO, all the parties expressly agreed that like the law was the code and the code is the law and that there's not going to be any type of, of um, a written agreements that the outcome of the code is going to prevail. And that was a big, a big part of the ethos of that project. They wanted to prove that there's new types of organizations in the world, which there are, right? These types of organizations are, are definitely going to be, um, I think, the new model um, for efficient organizations. But any organization at this stage that is willing to trust code entirely, I think might have a naive impression of, uh, of the realities of blockchain because it's so it's such a flexible and understood space that these vulnerabilities and risks are still present. And in the case of the DAO, you have this, I mean, I, you know, I don't know if it was the best result, right? A fork of the blockchain um, and people didn't agree to that. People thought, hey, like these people engaged in the DAO and they had all had a chance to inspect the code. They they shouldn't have any a remedy, but through this democratic consensus, the Ethereum Foundation, I guess, like gave them their money back. And that is interesting because there wasn't a legally clear outcome because people all engaged in the DAO under the understanding that the code is the law, uh, but you had a remedy even though the code failed. Um, so maybe in advance on the next ones, <laughs> Uh, you start to define, all right, what if the code fails? What if it gets hacked? What are going to be um, people's rights under those circumstances? Um, in the context of, of smart contracts on the Ethereum um, blockchain, and an another simple consideration is gas, right? Like transactions um, that occur pursuant to a smart contract are going to require gas. Um, contracts are incentivized to be cheap um, because of the gas requirements, but obviously there's only so much you could do with contract design. Um, so you want to understand like who's going to be responsible for this gas. Uh, maybe you consider a collateral requirement for the contract for people to post bond inside of some type of escrow that's going to act um, as a reserve 
for the gas cost, um, or maybe even you consider doing something like that to be locked up to act as collateral in case of breach, right? So if there's any type of dispute that the amount um, posted um, as the collateral for a contract can be liquidated um, as a dispute resolution um, um, mechanic so that people can can ha have a remedy early on as opposed to trying to file in court or something like that. So there's all types of interesting things that you can do um, by creating these escrows that serve the purpose of the smart contract, serve to reduce risk to parties engaging in these smart contracts. Um, title and authorizations. So this is a big one that's pretty simple to do. Um, you want people that are spending funds through a smart contract to represent that they own the Bitcoin or they own the Ethereum that they are using, that it's not stolen, um, that the Bitcoin to their best knowledge um, or, or perhaps that they completely represent that this cryptocurrency that they're going to use for this smart contract hasn't been on the list of any identified OFAC um, um, terrorist organizations or people violating sanctions, you want to make sure that these smart contracts are compliant with US regulations or or the relevant authority for your juris, jurisdiction. People are strict in the space. Um, there's definitely a big ethos like in the blockchain space that the law is is more flexible here or maybe doesn't apply here. And while there is some truth to that in the fact that legal frameworks are definitely being influenced by this technology, uh, I would say that people are still very skeptical and people want to put out bad actors and you want to be as compliant as possible. You want to play by the rules, especially where it's easy to do so. Um, so here, you know, getting parties to contractually agree that their Bitcoin is clean is, is a powerful way to increase compliance. Um, and so with, with authorization here is like, all right, so what is this smart contract doing? Um, it's, it's, it's acting, it's, it's memorializing obligations between two parties. Um, but is the smart contract itself implementing the law? Is the smart contract an agent of the parties that is designed to, to um, act in the best interest of the parties? But, but you have one smart contract between two parties. Is, this, is the smart contract conflicted? Who does it serve, right? Like there's, there's all types of these, these legal type of classifications of what a smart contract is. Is it an agent? Um, there's, are we going to delegate authority to a smart contract? Is that something that you want to do on paper, right? That you want to say, all right, I am delegating my authority as this company to this smart contract at this address. Um, that is something that you might want to consider to do on paper. It really depends on the circumstances of the particular transaction, uh, but, but it is something that would would reduce risk in the in the in the circumstance where where a contract doesn't behave as expected, or if somebody is going to challenge that the smart contract had any authority to act on behalf of the parties, um, it's it's certainly good to have on paper that um, on both parties saying that they they delegate their authority to an actual smart contract. Um, a trend in this space, in terms of like like giving power to the code, is this qualified qualified deference approach. So. Unlike the, the DAO framework where, where they're saying, all right, law is the code and code is law. Whatever the code does, that is the legal outcome that we're all going to accept. Um, the qualified deference approach um, kind of softens that. They say that the, the, the operation of the smart contract is binding. It's non-appealable. People have to accept the rules of the smart contract and the outcomes will be ex accepted as the legal outcome. However, there are certain exceptions for material adverse events um, that are defined in the actual contract itself that is designed to supplement the smart contract. So under certain circumstances, the contract or the, or, or the code of the contract ought to be instead disregarded. Um, and we should rely on the expectations of the parties instead as opposed to the code. It's an important distinction because if you don't make that distinction, and the implication is that that smart that people are going to agree to the terms of the smart contract, then whatever the smart contract does may be the legal outcome for those parties, absent um, um, any any type of agreements to the contrary. 
So in defining these material exception events, uh, at least on the Ethereum blockchain is kind of where this list was motivated. You have consensus attacks, right? If, 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 if somebody, if a contract is going to be changed or the terms of the contract are going to be changed um, because of some type of consensus attack, uh, that would be a material adverse exception event. Here you have the terms of the contract are being um, uh, modified without the permissions of, of both of the parties. That would be an example of when, all right, we're not going to trust this contract anymore because, because a material adverse exception event ha has kicked in. And the same would, would it would it generally apply for bug like bugs, um, defects and errors? You'd want to identify like which types of bugs and which types of of defects and and errors and to what degree is going to put the contract into this material adverse exception event category. Um, the same with oracle of corruption, right? If it, if if a if a if a contract is relying on third party data and there's evidence that that third party data is inoperable or it's been corrupted in some way. Um, it's not what the parties expected. Uh, the, that could be an example where, where we're now going to take things outside of the domain of the smart contract. Um, and, and we're going to use the, the party's expectation approach where, where what's on paper is what controls, um, unauthorized access here. Again, like these are types of things that par parties want to put in into the contract. Only the parties, that own the private keys or that are authorized to perform um, or, or to own the private keys are allowed to engage in this contract. We're not going to permit unauthorized people engaging in the contract. And if there's evidence of that happening, then the contract ought, ought to be um, uh, uh, um, halted. And the network failure is like, I, I guess this is especially um, true when there's like a time constraint on a contractual performance, right? If, if I need to get you Ethereum by a given time, um, but the transaction speed um, because of congestion or whatever is, is, is too slow and I breach because I get the money too late, um, there might be some type of way that we're going to say, all right, well, even though the code approach, it, it shows clearly that you were late on this agreement, um, I may be able to argue that there's a material adverse exception event and, and, and show that the network is what, is what caused my breach. So overall, with this approach, it's important for parties that are in, in engaging in smart contracts to to understand all the risks to identify all the technical errors all the strategic type of of um, um, plans that parties have in case of these errors occurring right you want to have a definite plan in case there is a consensus attack in case there is a bug maybe parties design a backdoor where they can freeze the contract that's another type of like controversial um, I'm route to right because it's like if if a party has the ability to you know laterally freeze a contract, then you get into an opportunity. You you create the the risk of opportunistic behavior. People can just freeze contracts just to slow things down, or maybe they do so on a false alarm, and then you kind of like lose the transactional efficiencies of smart contracts in the first place. Um, maybe you don't want that, but maybe you do want an option where if both parties agree to a freeze. That could be um, um, something that's more reasonable or create some type of staking requirement if people do want to freeze a contract, right? Like um, maybe you have terms that allow parties to freeze a contract so long as they're willing to stake a certain amount of Ethereum um, in association with the contract for a certain period of time, uh, right? There's all types of interesting um, trends that are developing in this regard. And it's interesting to see how like the economic incentive, the economic on-chain mechanic can actually be designed in the way to, cr to create more certainty and to reduce the risk of opportunism, right? It's a party is going to be less likely to freeze a contract if they have to stake, you know, some like N um, um, a multiple of the value of the contract itself, right? There's no economic incentive to, to have foul play there. Um, so kind of like a look forward and briefly in conclusion here, uh, smart contracts, very interesting trends in the consortium, the blockchain consortium space. That's where, you know, 
companies within a given market are are agreeing to deploy blockchains to permit some type of data sharing, some type of functionality that the consortia of, of people um, or market the participants agree to. That's an interesting deployment of smart contracts that requires a dual approach, both code as well as legal agreements that, that try to define that partnership. Um, but global implementations in financial technology seem to be the most poised. Uh, this is like a, a big ode to the DeFi movement, right? You have all these new types of financial products and tools that are being implemented on chain, but there's still relationships between consumers, customers, as well as the people who, who dispense these types of financial agreements. Um, there ought to be contractual clarity um, when these types of products are being distributed. So whether or not these products are capable of settling on their own, customers who buy them um, or interact with them still need to understand their operations, still need to understand the scope of the contract because you could get into a situation where, where a certain, a whole type of contract is deemed invalid. And, and this is kind of something that I meant to talk on about earlier, this, this doctrine of unconscionability. If there, it, it's kind of like the case where you have like, you know, like you click here just to access this software, but in the fine print, it says, you know, we have access to all of your life information and your right of um, a publicity and we can make a story about your life just because you wanted to use, you know, our, our Dropbox. It's like, no, it's like, that's not going to be a contract that a court's going to see as legally binding. It's unfair to enforce that type of agreement. That could be a disastrous scenario in the DeFi uh, movement or for any person like in this financial technology domain, if, if there is some type of like systemic evidence that, that people's um, um, products or services aren't, aren't, aren't behaving in, um, um, in accordance with the reasonable expectations of the customers. Same with digital media. Now, here's kind of like an interesting domain just because the transferability of copyrights and intellectual property, um, especially as like digital right um, standards are further developing for, a, for a display, display interfaces for a web, um, 3.0, a lot of the copyrighted content that we enjoy is probably going to start to operate into these like compliant channels where everything that you stream on Netflix, for example, could be, have like some type of proven copyright ownership. Things like that are interesting just because all of the, all of um, the activity of the human participants is already online, right? It's like if I want to use Spotify or if I want to access like a piece of art online, it's like all my interactions are already through this computer interface. So smart contracts can can easily digest that type of information um, and implement them in 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 a smart contract. And finally, decentralized organizations. So this is a really exciting area where you have these networks of smart contracts all designed to to automate um, some type of um, some type of output of an organization uh, what, and and with with governance layers on top so people creating these decentralized organizations ought to have agreements um, whether that's even just in the github repository of, of of the organization, but some type of explanation of what the organization is and what it does and what people ought to expect. Um, those would be the best practices in that space, but there's a lot more to talk about with, with respect to all these, um, but that is it. And thank you all for your time. Let's see here. Boom. Roshan, do you want to go ahead and stop that recording? Yes.